she'll be glad for it. <laughs> Any other birthdays? Well, she'll be watching this, so let's sing happy birthday to her. this week no anniversaries we're going to move on to announcements oh that's old one move on Caleb I noticed there is some meat in the deep freeze if uh, you're interested in that you can go over and take a look and see what's in there or if you need to talk to Pastor Cody he can help you get it uh, Kay Alani going to talk about this one all right I had mentioned it earlier at the early service and I'll kind of go over some things that I was thinking on this um, I just want everyone to see this or want everyone to see this as a tool to strengthen all marriages just like our relationship with Christ should continue to grow our relationship with our spouse should continue to grow also when we get to where we are thinking everything is good, then we stop looking to God to make things even greater. The mentor group and the date nights are to help make good marriages great and to come alongside those who need strengthen. We encourage you to come and join in the fellowship on Saturday, August 28th at 10 a.m. for a brunch and good time connecting with your spouse while painting. Today is the cutoff for signing up. Please get your pictures to us as soon as you can. You can pay by leaving cash or check in an envelope, mark date night with your name on it at the offering box. If the cost is too much, just let us know and we'll be glad to get it covered for you. Thank you. Sign up today, so don't forget that when you leave. Shane's not here. I am here. Oh, I looked right over you. <laughs> so just a reminder, guys, uh, we have two weeks left for signing up. The last day to sign up is the 29th of August. Sign up as soon as you're out here. Uh, we have been very blessed. We have had a member in our church come forward and has offered to pay for everyone's ticket to go to it. Uh, so the only cost that we will have is the cost of dinner that night. Uh, and again, we put a stretch goal out there for 30 people. So... Fish fry, September 18th. Um, we're just working our way up to that date with lots of preparations, um, lots of everybody needs to be preparing themselves for um, items that they would like to donate for our auctions. Um, if you're wanting to help with that, you can contact Sharon Frazee. Um, if you're wanting to work in the kitchen as a server, contact Tammy or Barbara, and they'll get you lined up on times on that. Um, the fish shack K usually works out there with those guys, so I'm not really in charge of that fish shack thing. So, uh, but if you're wanting to help cook or eat in the fish shack, um, it'll be open and, and they always have plenty of help out there. Uh, if there's any information you want to know about it, you can contact Tina, myself, Sharon Frazee, um, several other people in the church that can tell you information if you don't know about our fish fry or items that you can bring. I just want to specify it is not a, a rummage sale, so we can't take used items to put in our country store. Um, if you have a really good antique that you want to give us, um, we, John Smart would be glad to sell that for us at our live auction. Um, just There's flyers out here in the foyer. If you have some place you can put those up so we can get the uh, word out that this year we will have our whole fundraiser, that would be great. September 18th, like I said, if you have any questions, 
Um, and I think most of everybody that listens to the news know that there was another earthquake in Haiti yesterday morning. It didn't affect the area that most of the missionaries we help. Um, they don't, they're in the north and the northwest. This was more in the south, but we still need to be in prayer for them. And it may be that we have to use some of our funds um, to help them out down there. It was a large earthquake again with lots of um, fatalities. like that's all there is so I think it's time for greeting
go up there and light them myself. I don't have a lighter on me. Anybody got a light? Just kind of kidding. All right. All right. So uh, we'll go ahead and go into our theme time for this morning. Uh, I want to remind you before we jump directly into it, you know, it's so easy to get into just sort of a routine of things. And we're, we're big time creatures of routine, and I'm very much a creature of routine. But I needed to remind myself and want to remind you guys of why we do this, why we do this part of the service. Um, one of the, as I was praying and thinking back towards the end of last year, I was trying to set goals for what God wanted to do with this church in the year 2021. And one of the biggest things that came to my mind was establishing an identity, figuring out who we are, deciding who we are, and really understanding who we are as a church. And I came up with three categories, or the Lord gave me three categories, of who we want to be as a church. And that was being Bible-based, which means making our decisions based on the Word of God, teaching people the Word of God, letting that have the supreme place of authority and knowledge, being discipleship-driven, which means learning how to invest in people so that they can grow in godliness, so that we're not just saying, hey, here's the truth, best of luck with it, figure it out. That one's hard to make that step, say, hey, we're going to actively pursue discipleship. And then also being mission-minded, which is uh, understanding why we're left on this earth after, after we're saved. You know, if, if the whole purpose was just so that we could go to heaven, Jesus could have snatched us up out of here as soon as we got saved. But he leaves us here for a reason, and that reason is his mission. That's the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and his salvation. And so uh, keep that in mind. This is not just for no purpose that we go over these things. And this month in particular, we're talking about being discipleship-driven. And our passage for that is, comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, there are a few things we need to talk about from that passage there. So first of all, it says to stir up one another. The problem is we can get a little bit too comfortable in our seats. We can get a little bit too comfortable in our day-to-day -day lives, and we need other people to come around us to stir us up. One of the great purposes of church is to stir us up, to keep us from just getting too comfortable, and to keep us moving forward towards the goal of what it says there is good works. Okay, But not just good works of uh, earthly things, but heavenly good works. But then the latter part is what we really want to focus on, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, it's summertime, and during the summertime, a lot of people go on vacation. There's nothing sinful about going on vacation. In fact, there was a pastor who was once told, uh, well, he, he was scheduling a vacation with his church, and the, I don't know who it was, said to him, you know, the devil doesn't take a week off. So I don't know why you want this break, because the devil's not going to take a break. And the pastor said to them, yeah, he doesn't take a break, and look how unhappy he is. Okay, It's good to take a break at times. It's good to get a rest at times. But what we want to make sure is that we don't neglect the assembling of ourselves together, that we don't think that, hey, I can just go it alone, and I don't need to come to church. Because there's a, there's a caveat at the end there. All the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is he talking about? Judgment Day, the day of the Lord, you know, the return of our Lord. The more we see that day drawing near, the more important it is for us to come together and meet together as a body. Because we are in this together and we need each other. Let me ask you this. How good do you think things are in the world right now? They're not great, okay? Things, things just keep seeming to go from bad to worse. So what does this text tell us we need to do as we see those things happening? Come together all the more. All right, now, don't worry, this isn't going to be in the schedule right here, but uh, the early church in the New Testament says they met together in one another's homes daily, basically. They were always together. All right, the goal of planned ministry is to develop relationships so that you guys are always hanging out, so that we're hanging out even when we're not planning anything, because we need that sort of encouragement. We need people to invest in us. We need people to stir us up. And so that's the purpose. That's one of the purposes of the church. Uh, let's head into our prayer time and let's start with praises. Anybody have any praises they'd like to share?
Beautiful weather, yes. 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 Amen. Yeah, it's good to see that operational. That employs a ton of people. It gives us a lot of power. Absolutely. I'll give you guys an update on the baby. Uh, baby Hezekiah is doing just fantastic. His mom's doing fantastic. Uh, we're doing our best to get as much rest as we can. Uh, Unfortunately, it's actually fortunately, our son is growing stronger, which means his cries have grown stronger and louder, which make it a little bit more difficult to get rest. But it's, it's amazing. Usually when you hear a baby crying, you can start to get irritated or frustrated, right? But I'm, everyone has told us it's different with your own kids. And boy, is that true. There are times that I'll see him crying and he is just having a rough time. And, and I can't just help but honestly laugh a little bit because he's so cute when he does it. So... <laughs> It's wonderful. Everything is wonderful. We're getting enough sleep, not as much as we'd like, but uh, we're, we've been very blessed on that. So praise you. I'm sorry I stole it from you. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Any, yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, medication is an area that we can really struggle with at times of like, what, yeah, with what is trusting God and what is not trusting God. And I had a, a bit of a revelation that I'll share with you. Uh, the Bible calls for us to be sober minded a lot. Okay. And so used to, I would think, oh, okay, well, I shouldn't take any medication or do anything like that because it might make me not sober minded. But what about when you're in distress? What about when you're in agitated? If medication helps you to be sober-minded, then that's actually pushing you towards godliness. You know, so it's, you know, sometimes uh, I, I've, I used to be in a different camp as far as it came to even using things like medication. But the more you learn about it and the more you learn about just the manifest wisdom and mercy of God, it, it's wonderful. That's a wonderful report that, that she's able to get that peace, and I'm really enjoying that. Amen. Any other praises anybody would like to share? All right, how about prayer requests? So we'll keep Miranda in our prayers for that, yeah. Any others? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again with thanksgiving in our hearts to give you praise. For dear God, you give us the very breath in our lungs. You give us the heart beating in our chest. Dear God, you are the source of every good thing that we have. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to this in this place. Dear God, we thank you for just the the many wonderful blessings that you've given us. And dear God, we just ask that you have your way in this service, that you glorify your name through this service, dear God, and that you transform each and every one of us by renewing our minds, that you make us more like Jesus, dear God, that we might have, that we might have a true meeting with you this morning, oh God, that we might have a simple touch from your hand, oh God. Dear God, I ask that you glorify your name and transform us in the wonderful name of Jesus. try to pray daily, I don't know that I make it, that God transformed me so that I think like Jesus, walk like Jesus, and talk like Jesus. It's a big order, but you know, it, it, we need to pray, pray for that. I have two scriptures I want to, oh my goodness, I want to share this morning. Uh, the first one is from Isaiah, the 49th chapter and the 13th verse. Shout for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and, ha and will have compassion on his afflicted ones.
And then the next one is Psalms 103, verse 1. <clears throat> praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. I think from those words we understand we're here to praise God. So thankful for this beautiful place he's given us to worship, so let's stand and worship him. Revive us again. We do bring you glory and praise. Every word, everything we read in your scripture tells us how that is what you request from us, is to bring you honor and glory and praise. And we come to you now in one spirit, like-minded, in the name of your son, to do that expressly, to bring your name glory. We love you so, so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I had a, another scripture I wanted to read before we did our uh, communion song, and it's um, First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 13 and 14. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give generously at this time? Everything comes from you, and we give it you only what comes from your hand. So never let us think that we've done something wonderful when we place something in that offering because it all came from God to start with. And... Uh, our offering him is Come Thou Almighty King.
sound really good. Amen. Turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 4, if you brought your Bibles. You know, God always seems to give you what you need when you need it. He doesn't give it before you need it, although sometimes you would prefer it before you need it. I think a lot of us would prefer to have all the answers before a problem ever arises, but God often waits until the problem is there to give you what you need. Why do you think that is? Anybody want to speculate with me? To teach you patience? Now, uh, I was told when I was a kid, the one thing you don't want to pray for is patience. <laughs> but we need patience. No one shouted amen for that, huh? Okay. But what, what do you think, Nathan? So you'll reach out to him. God does not want us to be self-sufficient. We want to be self-sufficient. I want to just have everything that I need by myself. God wants us to have faith. He wants us to rely on him. And so uh, I say unfortunately, though it's really not unfortunate, but there are times in our lives that God will put us in a position where we have nothing left to give him but our faith and our trust, where we have no answers, where we do not have the solution, and we simply come to him and say, God, I need you. And that is the best place we can ever be. And that's sort of the story of Ruth. So to bring us back up to speed as far as where we've been in the book of Ruth, uh, Ruth returned to Israel with Naomi, her mother-in-law. You know, Naomi, if you'll remember, she had lost basically everything that she had held dear. She had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. She tried to push away her daughters-in-law even, but Ruth refused to be pushed away. Ruth clung to her. And as they came back, Naomi was bitter and she was hopeless in many ways. But Ruth kept running towards the solution to the problems. She found work as a gleaner. She was cared for and protected by Boaz. And then, uh, following the harvest, Naomi uh, persuaded Ruth to pursue Boaz for marriage. And he agreed, but he wants to follow the law. He wants to do things the right way. And there was another man who had a nearer right to redemption than Boaz did. So we left off at the end of chapter 3 with Naomi informing Ruth that Boaz would not delay in resolving the matter, that he would solve it that very day. Go to the Lord with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I ask at this time that you simply give us breadcrumbs from the table, O oh God, from your heavenly table, that we might know you, that we might grow in our faith today, and that, that as our sister said, that we might think a little bit more like Jesus, that we might act a little bit more like Jesus, that we might live our lives in a way that's pleasing to you as a result of what you do in us, O oh God. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So when we get to verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Now know this, that the gate of a city back in these times was where all of the business of the city was done. In some ways it was similar to what a city hall is today. We have a city hall where we would go and handle a lot of business. A lot of that stuff would take place in the gate of the city. So Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. So the way that this is worded, it's undoubtedly the same day that Boaz had just sent Ruth home to Naomi. She had came overnight and, and tried to persuade him or asked him to marry her, basically. And he sent her off early and sent her with a bunch of grain. And then he likely got ready for the day and went and resolutely waited at the gate of the city until he saw this man. And as soon as he saw him, he said, hey, come over here and sit down with me. My clicker working here. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Elders at this time are, are in some ways similar to the elders in the church. You know, these cities, they were run by family clans, basically. So we had the, the nation of Israel was broken down into the 12 tribes, and, and not all 12 tribes had their own allotment, but, but they had their, their uh, inheritance allotment there. And within those countries, as the families would grow and spread, you would have different groups of people that would pop up. 
And so your, your people would start on your family plot of land, but as your family would grow and expand, that plot of land could turn from, you know, just a house or something into more of a village and then perhaps even into a city. And so these cities would have elders. Now, they were elders because they were older. They, were, they had a little bit more wisdom. They were seen as sort of the family leaders, the patriarchs or the matriarchs of the family. And so uh, Boaz, knowing what he was about to do, wanted to make sure that there were elders there to witness it and to approve of it and to record it, basically. So he pulled the Redeemer down by him, and then he pulls the elders to come and observe and, and take part in what was going to happen here. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Right? He began to inform the Redeemer of the situation, and he starts with the land. He said, so I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he, being the Redeemer, said, I will redeem it. So Boaz started out by telling this man about the land that was for sale. Now, uh, we can even fast forward to where we are today. If a piece of land comes available for sale, especially if it's at a good price, and you have the means to acquire it, and you have the first right of refusal to acquire it, and someone says, do you want to buy that land? I think a lot of us would say, sure, absolutely, I'd love to buy that land. Land is, it's... It's, uh, it's income for them. You know, they were farmers. They, were, they, were, they farmed to raise crops for themselves to eat, to raise money. And so if you had more land, you could farm more. You could, you could do more with it. So the man says that he will redeem the land. And he knows he'll get a decent price on it because Naomi at this point is somewhat destitute. She's really in need, so she'll basically take whatever she can get as long as it's relatively fair price. So the man agrees that he wants to go ahead and redeem it, but then Boaz gives him a bit more information. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Ruth was a necessary part of this redemption, because as, as uh, mentioned briefly, but really as we could go into more Family names were incredibly important to the Israelites. Family names are still incredibly important to the Israelites. Uh, if you got your Bible, just real quick, we're not going to have it up on the screen for you. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew and look at chapter 1. Okay, anybody got it? Raise your hand if you got it there. You don't have to read it for me. Tell me what the first, uh, let's see, 17 verses are all about in Matthew chapter 1 genealogy. It was really important to be able to continue on your family name and to trace it back as far as you could. So if someone in your family basically died without having children, the right of redemption allowed them to have a child vicariously through someone else. So since Ruth was a widow here, and Naomi had been widowed, and Elimelech's name was not going to go on, the, uh, the practice of redemption in the land would require that this man produces a child for Ruth that would take the name of his, would have been grandfather, so that his family line could continue on. Well, upon hearing that, then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. This dissuades the man. When it was just the property, the man was very excited about purchasing it. He was willing to purchase it. But when there was a person involved, he was not as excited. And there were good reasons. This man apparently had a family of his own. His reasoning was he didn't want to have to divide his inheritance to anyone else. So he said, sorry, I can't do this. But there is a... Uh, there's a general observation we can make about this that we can apply to ourselves here in the situation. Adding land would be an attractive asset to just about anyone. Land was wealth. Land was an asset. Adding a wife 
would have been a burden, a liability, not nearly as attractive of a business proposition. The man wanted the property, but he did not want the person. And what I want you to understand from this is that this is the general way of the world. Mankind, and from a general standpoint, will generally look at you and say, what do you have to offer me? What do you have that you can provide for me? They will look at you based on what assets you have, and that's all that they really care about. And if you were a, uh, if you were a widow, if you were a destitute widow, you would not, would not have been a very attractive asset according to the ways of the world. But what about Boaz? What do you think Boaz desired more? The property or Ruth? Ruth. He desired the person rather than the property. The property would have been great and all, but to him that was an afterthought. That's not what he wanted. If he wanted the property, he would have pursued Ruth from the beginning. But he didn't. He didn't think Ruth wanted anything to do with him because he was a little bit older, and he was just trying to be a blessing to her. And lo and behold, she wanted to marry him, and then his hopes were through the roof, and he's, he was ready to resolve it that very day. Keep that in mind. We'll, we'll come back to that thought there. But verse 7 says, Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. This practice was actually spelled out in the law in the book of Leviticus. Uh, a widow, this one's interesting, a widow could actually demand that a near relative of her husband redeem her. She could go up, she could take him to the gate of the town and demand that he redeems her. And if he refused, she could take his sandal and it was meant to be a humiliating symbol for him that he would be walking around, you know, lopsided and that she would have a symbol to know that he refused to fulfill his obligation. Ruth didn't do that. Ruth didn't do that. Boaz was willing to do that for it, but it still remained a common uh, practice there as sort of just a piece of collateral to know that like, hey, yeah, I am forfeiting my right to redeem this land and to redeem this person here. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. He was basically in this way forfeiting his right to redeem the land and to redeem Ruth, which then allowed Boaz to have that right. Now, one thing I want you to notice in this story is kind of interesting. What's the name of this man? We don't know, do we? Why do you think we don't know? It doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because he doesn't turn out to be that important to the overall story. All right? Now, now understand, as I said, genealogies were very important. Family lines were very important. And sometimes they were even important from a humiliation standpoint. If someone did something despicable or evil in the land, a lot of times their name would be included here in the Bible as a sign of disgrace of what they had done as well. But the fact that this man's name is not included here shows just how unimportant he was to the story. Boaz undoubtedly knew this man's name. Ruth likely knew this man's name. Samuel could have even known this man's name. But his name does not even bear mention here because he's just sort of irrelevant after this. Did he sin by forfeiting his right of redemption? No. His reasoning was clear and it was fine. He wanted to take care of his own family, and he didn't want to have to divide his inheritance to another line. You know, polygamy is not a godly thing. He already had a wife, he had a family, so he didn't want to have to uh, break into that there. But why do you think Boaz's name is included? Why do you think Ruth's name is included? Why do you think Naomi's name is included? Yeah, let's continue on with this, and we'll see that. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Those were uh, Naomi's sons. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. 
So with this, he purchases the opportunity to redeem the name of Elimelech and his sons through Ruth, to provide for Ruth, to be to her a true husband, a true provider and protector, as we, we heard about talking about marriage last week. Uh, Boaz was up to that task. And then let's start to look at the fallout, because there's so much more that's still to come in the story, even though there are only a few verses left. It says, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. So first of all, they're just acknowledging the transaction that's just taken place there. But then they pronounce a blessing. It says, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrata and be renowned in Bethlehem. Rachel and Leah were who? They were the wives of who? Jacob, and they bore, between them and their uh, maidservants, they bore 12 sons for him. And so when they say, may, your, may the woman be like Rachel and Leah, what they're saying basically is, may she bear you many children. All right? And then may you act worthily in Ephrata and be renowned in Bethlehem. Now, what's important about Bethlehem? What do you know about there? Jesus ends up being born there, okay? Just keep that in mind. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, this one, it just, it goes further, because once again, family was really important. The people who were in this town were of the tribe of Judah. They were descended through Perez, so they're going basically, all the blessings of our forefathers be upon you, is what they're saying here. And they go one level to another. May your house be like the house of Perez, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So they pronounce this blessing saying basically may she be exceedingly fruitful and may your name be renowned the concept of a kinsman redeemer involves someone of value taking someone who has lost their value and giving them value again in the immediate story boaz was the one with wealth he was the one with property he was the one with provision and ruth was the one just looking for some help and so the blessing was that by her bearing fruit, by her being redeemed and then bearing fruit through children, that his name, Boaz's name, might be honored and renowned for his generosity and his kindness. But symbolically or theologically, we see the same thing with God. And you need to understand this because it's going to help you understand your own life and your own salvation. None of us, left to our own accord, had any value in regards to salvation. None of us had any value in regards to righteousness. I would try my hardest to be a good person, but even the good things that I tried to do would come out wrong every single time. I was bankrupt in that sense. God, when he called me out, he saw value in me when I had very little value, and he redeemed me. But the redemption isn't just a one-time thing. The goal of that redemption is that I would then bear fruit. That bearing fruit isn't having physical children in this sense. Once again, we're, we're talking spiritually, theologically here. But the goal is that I would bear the fruit of righteousness. That I would start to live in a way that was pleasing to God. So that I would bear fruit for Him. And that my Redeemer would get honor and glory and renown for what He had done in my life. That's the concept of a kinsman Redeemer. It works two ways. Israel as a people... What did God say about them? He said, I didn't call you because you were the greatest among people. I called you because you were the least. You were the most stubborn, basically. You were the most difficult, the most challenging. But I called you so that everyone else can see how good that I am based on what I will do through you. Your salvation is about you, but it's not about you at the same time. Your salvation is about God. All right? That you might be saved... And that he might produce righteousness in you. Not that you can say, oh boy, I've got it figured out. I'm going to write a book because I'm so amazing. No, but that you might say that God did all of this for me. God did all of this for me. You can write a book, but it better say God did all this for me. It's not, I found this because I'm superiorly intelligent. It's about look what God did in my life. He gives you righteousness so that you will give him glory. That's the thing. That's the Redeemer relationship. Ruth gave Boaz children. She bore fruit for him so that his name could then be renowned in the land. That's the blessing that was pronounced here.
But then there's more to the story. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. Remember, the story didn't start with Ruth. Although the title of the book is Ruth, the story started with Naomi. It started with Elimelech. Okay? And you need to understand here, we need to think about this. About Naomi's decision making and Ruth's decision making. But before we do that, I don't want to get ahead of myself too far. We're going to cover a couple more verses. He, being this this, uh, redeemer, well, being God here, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Okay. Naomi was given the privilege that every grandma would want. She was able to be the child's caretaker. But looking at an overview of the story, we can see great contrast from the beginning to end. And this is what's going to help us here. All right? Naomi faced problems every step of the way in the story. In the beginning, what was the first problem that started the entire story? There was a famine in the land. And what did Naomi and her husband do because of that famine? They ran away. They ran away from their problem and they tried to go somewhere else for help. And then what happened? Naomi's husband, he died. Naomi's sons, they died. And what did she do? Well, it was too painful to stay there anymore, so she ran back home. And she tried to push everyone away from her. She said, don't even call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because I'm exceedingly bitter because God's angry at me. Naomi consistently tried to run away from her problems at the beginning. She was hurt, and so she would flee and flee and flee and run away. But how many of you know you can't outrun God? Anybody know that? Anybody ever tried to outrun God? Okay, I've been there. But Ruth was different. Whereas Naomi ran away from her problems, Ruth ran towards the solutions. Naomi tried to get Ruth to go back to her family, and Ruth said, no, I'm not leaving you. If anything but death, you know, parts us, great, great be the curse on me, basically. She said, I'm going to stay with you no matter what. And then they came back to the land, and Ruth said, you know what, we've got to eat, so I'm going to go find us some food. So she went out, and she found the lowliest, basically the only work she could get. And then she had the boldness, by Naomi's uh, persuasion there, that she was even going to go and pursue a husband. You know how hard that would have been back then? You know, because we've talked about how biblical society was, and it was the patriarchy, and the men just ruled the world and stuff. You know how challenging or fearful that could have been for this woman this woman who saw herself in all likelihood as valueless as poor to say you know what i'm gonna go and ask him to marry me yeah she had humility and and even more so than that she wanted a solution to her problems she wanted a solution not just for herself but also for naomi okay let's fast forward this a little bit let's think about this When something bad happens to you, what does your human nature tell you to do? Fight or flight, and and oftentimes, when problems come up in my life, the goal is, well, let's just set that aside and just ignore it, and maybe it'll go away. Let's just, you know, not really deal with this. Let's acknowledge it, but then let's just, ah, I can get over it. It's not a huge deal. And you will do that until what? Until the problem gets so big that it starts to crush you. Anybody ever been in that state? Okay, amen. I, I know you have. You don't have to, you don't have to talk about it. I, I'm sure we've all been there. But what I found is that when I stop running from my problems and I start running towards God, who is the Redeemer and is the solution to all of my problems, things start to change. And that change doesn't just affect me. I have the great privilege of being a pastor, and here's here's where I'm bringing this all to for you. I have the great privilege of being a pastor, which means that sometimes I get to uh, share my sufferings with you guys, which is terrifying to do. 
to admit when I have a problem. But it's exciting to do because I know that any problem that I have is a temporary problem. And so long as I'm taking it to the foot of the cross, that God's going to solve that problem. And then I'm going to be able to tell you after the fact. Usually we don't mind talking about a problem after we've overcome it. But where God has prompted me from the beginning of this is to say, no, let him in even earlier. How much do you really trust me to solve your problem? Let them know while you're still struggling. Let them know why, while you still have this problem, because that means you really trust that I'm going to be faithful to solve it. That means you're not afraid that you're going to be dealing with this forever. And so I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that, but, but I'm saying all of that to say this. Ruth wasn't the only one who received the blessing for the way she went about solving her problems. Boaz also received the blessing, and Naomi also received the blessing. Naomi was too hurt to help herself for a long time. Naomi was too hurt to even ask for help. She tried to get herself alone, but Ruth was so resolutely persistent with her mother-in-law that she was able to see it through and be a blessing to her mother-in-law. This is the personal practical application of this story. When we, when we have a problem, when we stop running away from our problems and start running towards the solution who is Jesus Christ, God will bless us. And he will not only bless us, but then he will bless others through us. This is the point of church. This is why God doesn't just snatch you out of here when you get saved. If it was just about fixing your problems, he could do that and he would have done that. But the church is about continuing the mission on and delivering this salvation to others. Ruth could have been saved just for Ruth's sake, and God could have done that any number of ways. But the way that Ruth was saved, the way that she was delivered, ended up saving her mother-in-law as well. Do any of you have loved ones that you're tired of watching them suffer apart from the will of God? You're tired of watching them make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Anybody have any loved ones like that? What are you willing to do about it? Is it bad enough for you that you are willing to go before the throne of grace and plead for them to the Lord? Is it bad enough that you're willing to say something and step up? Because so often we're so scared that we're going to hurt someone's feelings if we ask if they need help. How bad does it have to get before you're ready to start running towards the solutions? When we diligently work hard towards finding that solution, we end up like Ruth. Ruth was in a rough way for a while, but she ended up being blessed beyond anything she could have dreamed of. And likewise, we, if we draw closer to God through our problems, we will be more blessed than anything we could dream of. Now, I know I'm being a little bit too general in this, but understand this. This is a learned thing. When one problem comes up, it might not seem natural to go to God. It's going to seem natural to, I can solve this myself, or I can just run away or push this aside. But if you learn how to go to God one time, it doesn't mean that the next time you're just automatically by default going to go to God with that problem either. But this is something that you can put into practice and progressively see growth and development in it. Anytime you have a problem, whether that problem is huge or whether it's teeny tiny, if you learn to say, instead of trying to solve this myself, instead of trying to just push it aside, I'm coming to you, God, for my answer, that develops your faith, which is what God wants for you in the first place, and then he's going to pour out blessings upon you, and then he's going to teach you how to do that for other people. But there's one more layer to this story. And the women of the neighborhood gave him, being the uh, son here, gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Who does David go on to be? He goes on to be the king of Israel. In fact, he goes on to be the greatest king in Israel, save for Jesus, the once and future king who is still to come. That all happened. It all started with a young woman refusing to leave her mother-in-law to suffer alone. It all started with a young woman saying, you know what, I'm going to stick by you through this and we're going to see it through to the end and I'm going to help you in any way that I can. It started with that resolute level of dedication. And it ended with a blessing to her, a blessing to her mother-in-law, 
a blessing to her family that extended down to where her family line, which was very important in Israel, ended up becoming the kingly line. And it extended even past that because from that kingly line came Jesus, the very Savior of the world. God could have used any individual person to fulfill his plan to this. He could have brought anyone in to this uh, bloodline here, so to speak. But he chose to use Ruth. And there's one other important thing that that teaches us. Same thing that Rahab is also in that family line. Where was Ruth from? Moab. Is Moab part of Israel? No, Moab was actually an enemy of Israel. God took a pagan foreigner, a Gentile, if you will, and brought her into Israel. Jesus Christ did not just die for the Israelites. He died for the sins of the whole world. Israel was never just an ethnic or bloodline type of thing, though it was very important to them. It was always a matter of faith. Ruth was not born an Israelite, but she became an Israelite through faith. Now let's apply some of this to the church here. Okay? We've seen directly what Ruth's actions led to here. Her actions, the kingship of David, would actually be what delivered the Israelites from this cycle that we had been covering before we got to the book of Ruth. The cycle that we saw in the book of Judges. This cycle of the people disobey and they're, they're completely against God and God sends judgment and then they repent and then God sends a deliverer and it happens over and over again. David gave them stability for the first time. Saul sort of gave them stability, but Saul wasn't a good king. He was rejected very early on and, and things were still just with tragic there. But David was the deliverance from a lot of this cycle. Know that the decisions we make today don't just affect us. They affect us, but they also affect the generations that follow us. Think about that from what I'm about to say here. As everyone knows, Kelsey and I just entered into the wonderful wonderful world of parenthood and one of the realizations of early parenthood is the potential impact of each and every decision that we make it can be absolutely terrifying to think of okay well well as far as when do we need to feed him because if we feed him too soon he could throw up if we don't feed him long enough he could starve you know oh is he getting enough sleep is he being put in the right position to sleep because we don't want him to roll into the wrong position but even then once he starts to grow what what are we exposing him to what's he seeing on the television what's he hearing from us how are we talking you know just all of the gravity of each and every decision that we could make but not just the potential impact of each and every decision, but the value of time. Each and every moment. I went to Menards the other day to buy a faucet. I was gone for maybe two hours tops. And from the moment I left the house, babies changed so much so quickly, the, the fear running through my head was, what am I missing? What's happening while I'm gone? Our son, he's done some crazy things already. He's two and a half weeks old and he's already rolled over. They're not supposed to do that, okay? Yeah. It's, it's crazy to think about that, and it was, what am I going to miss? When Kelsey was pregnant, I went to play basketball one night, and that was the first night he had kicked inside of her. And I missed that because I was chasing something that was just silly. It was just a hobby, something that didn't matter as much. The things that have really occurred to me since, sorry, got a little bit too close there, since my son was born has been just how important every decision may, every decision is and just how important every day is, every hour is, every minute is, because you don't know how long you're going to have and you don't know exactly the weight and the gravity of the decisions you make are going to have on your kid. In fact, most of modern psychology, if you've got issues, what do they look at? They say, oh, well, let's go back to your childhood. Let's see what happened there. Okay? It's all very important. But I don't want to just talk to you about me. It's motivated me to make every single minute count. A lot of the things that I used to pursue, just a lot of time wasters, I haven't been able to touch them just because, uh, you know, any time that I could be staring at a screen to play video games, I could be looking at my son and he could do something new. You know, it just made those things just seem less important. But I'm not saying all this just to talk about me. I'm saying it to talk about the church. This church was founded in what year? 1864. Okay, we've been around for, that makes, let's see, 157 years, I think. Yeah, that's about right. 
157 years, and we are here today in large part due to decisions that were made long before any of us were born. It's interesting to think about. But think about it in the other direction, too. Decisions that we make today are not just going to impact us, but they're going to impact every future generation that comes through these doors. Does that scare you? It puts a healthy fear in me. Throughout my pastorate, I made a few too many decisions that were based on appeasement. You guys know the policy of appeasement? It's what led to World War II. Germany said, basically, we want this little piece of land, and, and people are like, well, we really don't want to fight, so let's just appease them and give them that. And they said, well, now we want that. I said, well, it's not worth the effort, so let's just, and then all of a sudden they had conquered a large part of Europe, and it's like, okay, now we have to fight. Unfortunately, at times, I've been an appeasing pastor. I don't think it's unique to me. I think it's, it's very common for a lot of churches today. I want people to like me. I want you guys to like me, and we want people to like us, and we want people to be able to get along. So we try to do our best to not step on people's toes. But unfortunately, in doing so, we, and I say we, but let's, I, at times, have minimized what should be the most important factor in decision-making. Anybody know what that factor is? God. Yeah. What is the will of the Lord? There have been too many decisions that I've made and too many decisions, honestly, that we as a church have made where it's more about what do I want, what do I want, what do I want, and less about God, what do you want? And I've resolved earlier this year to stop being a coward in my decision making. Okay, let me repeat that. I have resolved to stop being a coward in my decision making. You know, I... I I was and still am in some ways a young pastor. This is my first pastorate, and so it's a little bit extra scary when you're, you know, when you're the guy for the first time, you're like, okay, make the decisions. And so I wanted to make people happy, and I still want to make people happy. People's feelings are important. They're just not the most important thing. The will and the glory of God are the most important thing. I've resolved to stop running away from problems, as Naomi was doing, and start running towards the solutions to those problems. As a result of this, the elders and I have decided that there's a change that we need to make. First of all, the change is to start, we, we mentioned, we've been, you know, having meetings and talking about a lot of things, and we've decided that we need to start prioritizing the spiritual, as, spiritual side of the church more than the business side, it, to prioritize the spiritual aspects over the business aspects. Everybody in agreement on that? Okay. Obviously, we need to do that, but it's so easy to get in a routine where it's just business as usual. So in deciding that, we, we realize a problem that is heading to a poor climax if we don't address it. We've had two services for the past seven years or so. And there have been lots of there's been a lot of good that has come out of having two services. But unfortunately, one of the side effects has been we have started to develop into two churches. Okay? It hasn't completely been that way. There is overlap, but I've seen it as, as simple as when we're planning an event, and you know, let's say someone in late service is in charge of this event, we'll say, well, who are those people? Because they're people who go to early service and they've never even met. That's a problem. I've had a problem that when we've had combined services, we've had a mindset of like, well, we've got to make sure we have two contemporary songs, and we've got to have two traditional songs. We've got to make sure that everyone's taken care of. It's become a situation where it's like there are two children vying for their father's attention. And it's not by any intent of anyone. It's because we went with what's comfortable. We went with what's appeasing. And so what I'm telling you here is that effective January of 2022, the elders and I have decided to combine our Sunday services on a weekly basis for the sake of the unity of the body. Now understand here, because this is, this is gonna be inconvenient for some people to do this, right? Because what you need to know is we're not gonna get rid of the early service and run the late service all the time. We're not gonna get rid of the late service and run the early service all the time. What our goal is going to be is to take the best aspects of what we're doing on each service and to perfectly marry them into something that is best for everyone. That's the goal. But that's gonna be challenging. 
all right? Because we are creatures of comfort, we are creatures of routine, and we like knowing what's expected and saying, hey, we're going to come in here, all right, we're going to have uh, birthdays and anniversaries, we're going to have announcements, we're going to greet people, we're going to have our theme, we're going to have prayer requests, we're going to sing a few songs, we're going to, you know, have a sermon, we're going to pray again, we're going to have another song, we're going to have communion, then we're going to have one more song, and we're going to send us off. We're used to that. We get comfortable in that routine, but God will break our routine for the sake of his glory. What our service is going to look like from a practical standpoint is still going to be determined. I can't tell you what time it's going to start. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like. But what I want you to know is that the heart of the, the decision, at the mindset of the decision, is saying, God, what is your will? And that's what we're going to seek to find out. Because there's something else that's going to come along with this. Because there's been a fire put in my heart just this past week even towards evangelism. The church has to break out of these four walls, and we need to start making an impact on our community. But to do that, we've got to come together in every single way, shape, and form. We have to unite, and we have to be empowered together so that we can fight together for the soul of our community. The time's come to stop making decisions based on convenience and preference and to start making decisions based on the will of God and for the glory of God. God. The goal is to establish the identity of who we are as a church, grow in that identity, stir one another up towards righteousness and holiness, and then pursue the work of evangelism and missions together. Church, in closing, and I mean that this time, the time has come to stop running from our problems. The time has come to start running towards the solutions. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Dear God, you know my heart that, that I want nothing more than for everyone to like me, for everyone to get along, to never have any problems. But dear God, problems aren't a bad thing. Problems are a good thing because problems are the only way we grow. So dear God, I ask that you give us the strength and the courage to not go from just bad to good on some of these things, but to go from good to better. Dear God, that we might grow in the unity of the faith, that we might grow uh, with our mission in mind of your kingdom and your glory and your will, and that we might be a powerful church that the gates of hell cannot stand against. Dear God, I ask that you make the spirit of, that you, you make your Holy Spirit so palpable in here that people cannot come into this place and remain in their sin that they're brought to a place of decision where they either have to run to you or they have to run away because your presence is too strong here. Dear God, let us not become comfortable in a life that is not pleasing to you. Prompt us, stir us up towards your glory and your righteousness and your holiness. I ask this in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. we could just not even have communion and go home. <laughs> it's exciting. Before we have communion, I just want to, Marla shared an article that on uh, baptism and communion with, with me this week, and it was, a, it was about when someone gets baptized, we need to be a part of that. We need, that needs to be a renewal, a reminder for us. And the same thing with communion. This is just not something we do out of habit every week. I mean, we do do it every week, but it needs to be personal. And we need to remember what communion is about. And it's about what Jesus did for us. And if he hadn't come and died and bled and rose again, we have no lot, chance at all for life. So this is, I want us to think about that as we're singing. We're going to sing nothing but the blood because without the blood, we are nothing. Let's stand.
Well, the God, as we are marching on our way to heaven, Heavenly Father, as we live up on this earth, we thank you so much for the wonderful life that you've given to each one of us, Heavenly Father, and we are one with you, all of us, Heavenly Father. And today, as we stand in recognition of your son and what he's done for us and dying on the cross for our sins, being buried and rose again, Heavenly Father, and now as we partake of these emblems, let us do so in the memory, Heavenly Father, of your Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we continue this prayer, Lord, I am thankful for the message given today that shows your divine plan, Lord. Lord, from a time long before we came, you had it established, you had it laid out, and Lord, you have shown us the path that was given through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we partake, I just thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to give us salvation. And Lord, I pray that each one of us that is here today takes a moment to fully understand what was truly given for us, for the body that was broken, for the blood that was shed, Lord, that one day we may stand before you and be cleansed white as snow. Lord, we thank you and praise you you all the glory. Amen. Amen. Usually whenever I'm looking for a song to close out with, I always want something, you know, joyful and peppy, but this is a song God gave me, and I think if we really think about the words as we're singing it, it's, it's a good thing to leave here on and uh, to live by this week. If you'll stand, we'll sing Take Time to Be Holy.
Amen. I hope you've been stirred up this morning. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, continuing on there, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Dear Heavenly Father, be with this people as they go, dear God, and bring us all back here safely uh, one week from now, oh God, that we might continue to grow in this faith. But dear God, let us not limit that growth to Sunday by Sunday basis. But dear God, I ask that you sanctify a time for each and every one of us throughout each of our days, that we might come to you and have fellowship with you and grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Have a blessed week.